My name is Dr. Suzanne Humphreys, and I'm a medical doctor and co-author of a book called Dissolving Illusions. Up until 2011, I worked in the conventional medical system as an internist and nephrologist. Kidneys are fascinating and complicated organs, without which your blood, bones, lungs, heart, and brain won't function normally. Because of that, kidneys are really important. I want to tell you some of the things that occurred during my medical career, starting near the beginning. I set my sights on a series of goals. The university degree came first, then a two-year stint in a cell biology lab. And then, because I wanted to work with humans, I went to medical school. On June 1st, 1993, I started a residency in New York City, one month before the National Institutes of Health held an international workshop on current issues on vaccination a topic that was nowhere on my radar. The published summaries and abstracts from the weekend in July reveals what some of the participants were studying. Discussions of the primitive level of the science of adjuvants, of vaccine contaminants, and unexpected adverse reactions. Interference in the normal immunologic response as a result of vaccination, shedding of revertent virulent polio viruses after vaccination, as well as dreams of future combination vaccines and new delivery systems. In 1989, I had a series of hepatitis B vaccines, after which I was unwell for some time, but never connected the dots, because all I had been taught about vaccines was that they were the greatest contribution to public health ever. After the residency, I completed a nephrology specialty in Philadelphia then became an assistant professor of medicine, teaching various levels of doctors and students, and later moved on to a private practice in a large teaching hospital. I sat and listened to doctors who said things like, Paul Offit says that 10,000 vaccines can theoretically be given all at once to babies, and anti-vaccine people are a threat to human survival, and aluminum is important for the growth of a healthy fetus. So those are my academic qualifications. Today, in 2015, my critics find it easier to ignore my scientific degrees and CV and choose to sneer me down by saying, she's a quack homeopath. So let's clarify the issue. There's no denying that some people heal under the care of homeopathy. I did attend the School of Homeopathy in the United Kingdom from 2008 until 2011 while still in full-time medical practice. However, I did not complete my studies and never earned a degree. I am not and do not wish to be a homeopath. While I loved many aspects of homeopathic theory and study, homeopathy didn't work in my hands as a practitioner in training. I have no regret in doing it during my quest to broaden my understanding of disease and healing in order to give my patients something more. I do hold a bachelor's degree in physics. I am a physicist and have used physics. I am an internist and a nephrologist and have taught medical students, residents, and fellows in training. Yet, strangely, the critics zero in on something I'm not even involved in and call me a quack homeopath. I find it amusing that skeptics rarely let the truth get in the way of their delusions. Back to my real world as a newly trained doctor. Little did I know that what I was taught about vaccines and immunity meant that I had absolutely no idea what I was talking about and left me blinded when confronted with the real world. And this is still the case for the majority of medical professionals today who are at the front line of patient care. I knew nothing about vaccine manufacture, contents, risks, or history. We had been told historical factoids about Jonas Salk inventing one polio vaccine and Albert Saab in the other and that smallpox and polio were supposedly eradicated by vaccination. I certainly knew nothing about the developing immune system. After being handed the schedule of vaccines for kids during my pediatric rotations, I was told to give them on time. That was the extent of my knowledge. As a nephrologist, I gave hepatitis B vaccines to dialysis patients. Their immune systems don't respond very well, So we often had to give them numerous injections of high-dose vaccine, which is an enormous aluminum load. I gave flu shots, pneumonia shots, all per dialysis protocol, never considering any potential problems. Nothing was linked to vaccines in my mind until one patient in 2009 volunteered to me. I was fine until I had that flu shot. And I thought, well, that can't be. 
but the other doctors and I could find no alternative cause. Until 2009, I had never once considered vaccines as a potential threat to kidney health. This was my sentinel case. A man who had normal kidneys documented by blood work prior to December, then was vaccinated in his doctor's office and came to the hospital in renal shutdown two weeks later. He required dialysis for about three weeks and then was taken off of dialysis, but his kidney function only returned to about 70%. I want to show you a sampling of some other cases that I made record of after that first eye-opening event when I began to ask the simple question, when was your last vaccine? This 69-year-old man had documented normal kidney function prior to getting his swine flu shot mid-December and developed kidney failure. He stopped making urine and had dangerously high potassium levels and acid buildup within four weeks. He was placed on dialysis and died one month later after having a massive stroke. Then another man came along with normal kidney function he got an H1N1 and seasonal flu vaccine in mid-December 2009 and came to the hospital about four weeks later with severe nephrosis, losing massive amounts of protein from his urine. His kidney filtering capacity was also down by about 20% from his former baseline. He was treated by me for two years with heavy-hitting immunosuppressive medicines without much improvement at all. On discussing my cases at our practice, my colleague pulled this file from 2005 to show me. She had normal kidneys, got a flu shot in October of 2005, and developed an acute illness on the day of injection. She started dialysis five days later, underwent several dialysis treatments, and then regained kidney function. But as of 2009, had only about 40% of normal kidney function. This 56-year-old man had normal kidneys, then got a seasonal NH1N1 shot as separate shots in December. Four days later, he developed nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. On January 1st, his kidneys were totally shut down and he started dialysis. He continued for 11 days and then was able to come off, but only regained about 80% of his former kidney function. Well, this might not seem like a big deal, but having a large dialysis catheter placed into the internal jugular vein and getting 11 days worth of dialysis with all the inflammation that dialysis causes in the body really is a big deal. Add to that the drugs and chemicals required during and between dialysis treatments and the costs are hundreds of thousands of dollars each time this happens. Because of seeing several patients with kidney failure after outpatient vaccines, I started looking at what happened in the hospital after vaccines. This is a patient who had mild renal impairment and was admitted for an unrelated issue. He was given the quadruple strength flu vaccine for the over 65 age group on the fourth hospital day. On the graph, you'll see it is denoted there as 9 25. He developed kidney failure within 24 hours and I was consulted at that time. It took several months for his kidneys to settle back down but they only returned to about 60% of his former baseline. This woman had a ruptured intestine. She was operated on and did well post-operatively. Then five days later, she was given two vaccines, one for influenza and one for pneumococcus, upon which her kidneys shut down and she was started on dialysis. She regained about 60% of her kidney function and was discharged to the rehabilitation service only to return a few weeks later with new onset seizures. She died in the hospital. As nephrologists, our patient base is typically one of very serious illness, often with numerous comorbidities. So when dealing with these people, there's always that question mark. Are we just seeing the anomalies of a constantly sick population base? Well, that question was answered when I thought back to a situation a year or so previous when I had taken care of two healthy people who were told vaccinations were a necessary part of hospital employment. One lady was hired in the kitchen and had a severe glomerulonephritis after the varicella or chickenpox vaccine. The other lady also had a severe glomerulonephritis after the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. The MMR vaccine-injured employee was still on dialysis in 2011 when I left. She was doing quite poorly after being otherwise healthy with no known medical problems. To begin with, 
I thought that it was an unfortunate thing, one of those one in a million cases that we hear about. But as the numbers of patients who said to me, I was fine until I had that vaccine increased, I got concerned. Then, after the swine flu vaccine was introduced as policy on admission to the hospital, which often confused my ability to diagnose the problems they were admitted with, more questions filled my head. So that was what I saw with my own two eyes and what my own patients were telling me. Any other time a drug was even a possibility for causing a kidney problem, there was no resistance by my colleagues to stopping that drug. Kidneys are so important that you never take a chance with them unless a life is in immediate jeopardy. Hospital-acquired acute kidney failure carries a 50% mortality rate. The answer seems simple, doesn't it? Don't vaccinate sick people in the hospital. Knowing that I would not be able to stop the vaccines altogether in hospital patients, I simply placed a do not vaccinate order on my patient charts with kidney disease whom I was consulted upon. I asked the administration to delay vaccines until discharge day. Doesn't this seem reasonable? Well, little did I know.